utility has to charge the consumers, which means we end up at this point on the demand curve, and we lower the sacrifice by consumers, although we have an even bigger uh, welfare loss on the production side. But it may be politically more attractive because the consumers won't scream as much as in the renewable portfolio standard. So by the way, this is the one that Carl said a couple of weeks ago, Carl Hando said, this will cost you, in our simple estimation, 20 billion pesos a year. Now, that would be every year, as the cost of renewables come down, of course, uh, would be losing less and less. Uh, other drawbacks of FIT, it sounds a little like communism because the government is just uh, bureaucrats are, uh, are choosing what subsidies to give. So we don't really subsidize hydro, even though it's just as renewable and has all the benefits of um, other kinds of renewables. So from each dam according to its ability to each wind solar farm according to its needs. That doesn't sound like very efficient. Um, then, of course, there's the great intermittency cost we have to think about. And suppose we put the fit price so high that it becomes very attractive, then we get a rush of people trying to get the permits, and that overwhelms the bureaucracy and the utility, and they put all kinds of red tape in your way. And whenever there's red tape, the response is, Bobby, how do we be the ones that get the permit. How do we get first in line to get the permits? So then there's rent seeking costs. Um, let's see. So we've talked about ideal regulation as if the regulator is causing the market to be like a competitive market. But a real-world regulation is usually rate of return. So we say, OK, we'll, give, we'll let you have 10% rate of return. But that gives disincentives called the average Johnson effect. If you're the company, you can get, we, we have this HECO company in Hawaii that are monopolistic utility provider, and so they have the best vehicles, the best building, the best view, and the most beautiful staff. So that's all cost, and they get 10% on a bigger number, so their profits are actually going up. Now what economists haven't documented is that you also have an, uh, an incentive to increase your labor, at least it doesn't decrease your profits, and so you can hire your friends and relatives and uh, more beautiful people. So that's not very good, but the ideal regulation that the economists know about is the two-part tariff. You simply say, okay, there's the efficient solution where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. I'm going to give the franchise to whoever will sign this contract, but then the utility says, wait a minute, the price you're giving me is less than the average cost, so I'm going to be losing that amount. So all you do is say, well, you can charge a hookup fee or an annual fee just to be connected to the grid and make up that difference. So that's perfectly efficient but nobody does it, so which is a mystery to me. I mean, of course, the costs are hard to estimate, but nowadays we have advanced econometric and uh, optimizing methods to recover the marginal cost, so I'm not sure why we can't really do that. So one hypothesis is the historical accident of 
Vernon Smith, who's the Nobel Prize winner in uh, starting in 79, he wrote a paper pointing out what the economies of scale do you really have in electricity? Uh, coal plants, economies of scale are exhausted around 400 megawatts. Uh, transmission, if you look at countries like France, you see one transmission line, and right next to it is another identical transmission line. So that means constant cost, not declining costs. And he did all this experimental stuff in New Zealand and Australia and adopted deregulation and market approach followed by New Zealand, Singapore, Australia. And these other countries, and including the Philippines, didn't have a complete market system, had more of a hybrid system. So <clears throat> Singapore and New Zealand have market systems. But just this is I wouldn't say this is meant to be empirical analysis, but just on the first block, we don't really see that there's an overwhelming case for markets just by looking at the price. So you see there what the prices are. Uh, California has this hybrid system where the utility has to buy from wholesale market, but the retail price is regulated. And that's something like what you have in the Philippines. They ended up with prices that are 50% higher than on the US mainland. Of course, in Honolulu, we have super high prices. So, as uh, we noticed that as, as California, which has an aggressive renewable program, promoted renewables, and the blue lines, especially recently, are completely dominating the additions of capacity. So what we noticed is that the retail prices are going up, even though the wholesale prices are going down. Uh, this is the famous duck diagram, which just shows uh, it just shows that that's just the net load that goes down when you have a lot of solar. It goes down in the belly of the duck, and then there's this very rapid uh, ramping. So you need to ramp up there in California. By 2020, you'll need to ramp up by 13,000 megawatts in three hours. So it means you're turning on your gas, ramping up your coal, doing all these things, because the sun went down. That's just the actual data, but you can see that. Um, I guess I'll just mention, uh, I've been trying to, I've been wondering what the, Secretary Kusi means by this fuel agnostic policy, and he says just we need generation. Seventy percent of our generation should be base load, and ten percent should be peak load, and then twenty percent should be mid peak. And then after that, you can be fuel agnostic and pick the least cost resource with due attention to environmental problems, which is to the economist uh, the least uh, marginal social cost. So he might mean something like this, that you, you see these very hypothetical off-peak, mid-peak, peak, uh, low requirements, and then you might just hypothesize that, well, you might as well just run your coal all the time since that has the lowest levelized cost of something that's running full time. And so maybe coal would win that contest, then gas for the peak and diesel for the peak. Um, that doesn't quite make sense because if coal really has the lowest levelized cost, and what you should do 
is buy a few more coal plants and then run them at 95% capacity in off-peak times and then ramp it up to 100% during peak times. But maybe Kusi already knows that and his engineers have told him, well, actually you're really off-peak is only 65%, so I've already made this computation by getting the 70%. So our only point here is we need a model to really solve these things. Everything is potentially endogenous, so we're trying to, the people here are trying to work that out. Um, this is just something that Nonoy Boplas uh, published last week, I guess. Just showing a rough correlation between the more countries have subsidized renewable, the more solar capacity they have, the more solar and wind capacity they have, and the higher the price. So this sort of is another indication that you might be lowering wholesale prices, but you're raising, typically raising retail prices. This is just a, shows why the wholesale, wholesale prices go down. You've seen this probably, many of you have seen this uh, merit order kind of graph where you start with the blue line and say, what are the levelized costs for hydro, coal, gas? And you get this kind of supply curve and if we have mandated variable renewable energy down at the bottom, it's really just shifting the whole supply curve over and you end up with lower prices. So that's really what happens in the wholesale market and this is what economists were saying until very recently. In fact, they said this is a disadvantage of subsidies that the price will be too low. But then empirically, of course, you see that the retail prices are not low or high. Um, of course, there's price variability. You can look at the wholesale prices over the months. Um, the Luzon, the uh, load curve is not as dramatically different in the peak and off peak as you might guess. Looks something like that. Uh, just look at the lower one is the demand without the reserve. And then that results in somewhat fluctuating spot prices, but not wildly. We just see that one peak at 5 o'clock for this particular day. In Texas, where they've been aggressively pushing wind, you actually see negative prices showing up every once in a while, which is a surprise to an economist. How can you have a negative price? But it's because I'd rather pay money for you to take my electricity then endure the cost of turning it off. So it actually happens in Texas, they get negative prices. Then you can see the fluctuation. Uh, there's other demand conservation programs. One of the questions that comes up, do we have to have a smart grid, which could do things like the utility could control your refrigerator and water heater if you sign up for the, the adjustable contract and they can remotely turn off your appliances uh, or you could see the re real-time price and adjust it yourself. Uh, Wellington has one of its 12 retailers which is striking to me because Manila has one company for 20 million people and Wellington has 12 retailers for a quarter of a million people. One of them decided to pass on the real-time pricing. It remains to be seen how popular that is. Most people don't like to be managers. They just like to turn on the lights, turn on the air conditioner, and see a fairly stable bill. So we'll see how successful that is. I mean, people can potentially save money if they want to be managers. But um, so far, we don't have strong evidence that that will work, but there are other pro programs that are familiar with interruptible load here. Uh, Morocco also offers time of day pricing for large 
companies uh, hasn't really taken off completely. There's also aggregators that, that uh, can potentially write contracts with uh, generators and customers. So you can do some amount of demand conservation without those sophisticated uh, uh, smart, smart grids that I just mentioned. Peak load pricing uh, should be understood as a means to price the capacity, not so much the spot price. So this is the way we should be pricing the difference between spot prices, which is marginal cost, and retail prices, which has to include fixed cost. So we should say, uh, in the peak load and off peak load, we have the net demand after subtracting operating costs. And this becomes like a public good because you're using the same capacity and peak and off peak, so you add the demand curves together and find the capacity costs for peak and off peak. And this can be very dramatic. Many textbooks show this with the off peak being zero. Um, but the market doesn't do that because the spot market is wholesale and this is retail. So, so far we don't have a mechanism for doing that. And the mechanism that's recommended by Frank Wobach, who was here, who's uh, been working on this for a long, long time at Stanford, is the futures market. So that it's not only the spot market, but you can contract and, and independent um, intermediaries or retailers can contract to buy electricity in the future and sell electricity in the future. So that's going to be the long-term prices, including the fixed costs. So we need we don't have that market in the Philippines. So we can't have a completely market system unless we have the, something like futures markets and. Um, Competitive selection process is very, very limited in comparison. So what kind of renewable policy can we have? Well, fuel taxes come straight from the externality theory. Uh, Asimov, the famous MIT economist, have, has said, you only need two instruments, fuel taxes and R&D subsidies. For a small country, the R&D should be more adaptive research. And then there's some things that need to be done in coordination, especially the transmission planning in addition to the futures market. Um, we talked to NGCP more than a year ago, and they said, well, on the one hand, we're responsible for transmission planning, but..." DOE has to approve it, and ERC has to approve it, and they're not moving. So we can't do anything. In the meantime, we're buffered by all these demands from Negros, former sugar plantations who want to do solar, and they already got the fit for solar, and they're demanding that we put up transmission. So they, they feel sort of squeezed in the middle, so that's an important function. Um, since we're almost out of time, I'll just make this one point that um, if you look at uh, where the variable renewables are, it's at the end of the system. So we have solar and wind up in Ilocos Norte. So you, you wonder why it should be at the end of the system. And strangely enough, and there's a reason for that because that's where electricity is the most expensive because you have to not only generate it but endure the transmission costs all the way up there. So in economics jargon that's called the shadow price. The shadow price is higher. It's easier to beat the shadow price in the far reaches of the system. 
But now you have, both in the north and the south, people are trying to become exporters. So since it was such a good idea, they thought, well, we'll move from importing to exporting. Uh, okay, I'll just finish this sentence more or less. And, but then you have to think, well, if I'm an exporter, now I have to cover the transmission costs. So now I'm looking at the comparison between the level of the cost of my solar plus the transmission cost, and I still have to beat the whatever I save from not building the coal plant if we're thinking long term. Now maybe that would still pass because in Negros, uh, I don't see Raul Favelia here, but oh, there he is. So Raul is always saying what a great uh, thing it is to have solar in Negros because you can, you have this extra resource book out from the sugar cane. So it's possible that the land costs and the production costs are so low that you can still um, cover those extra transmission costs. But I think we need a study to say that. And I'll stop there. <laughs>